Okay. I'm, my name is Simon Woodruff. I am the founder of Yo Sushi. Has anybody here been to Yo Sushi? Uh, very reassuring to see smiles. And I'm the founder of Yotel. Has anybody stayed in Yotel? Not so many people. The um, hotels at uh, Gatwick South Terminal and Heathrow Terminal 3, Schiphol Airport, and now 750 rooms in New York. Very radical hotels. And I am also the founder of Yo Home. Has anybody been to Yo Home? Uh ho, you haven't got, so, or as they say, Yo Ho Ho. You haven't got so far to go, just two blocks over here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to, you can ask me what you want. So I'm really no expert at anything. I left school with two O-levels. Did anybody get less qualifications than that? There's always one. <laughs> yes! And um, I became really, I, I, I thought, what do I like doing? I thought, I like rock and roll. Somebody said, you know, if, if you're going to spend all your life working, do something that you really like. And I like rock and roll. That was the only thing to do with work where I could think of anything that I liked. So I became a roadie putting up the lights in the very early days of the rock shows. And um, I then went on to be, you know, so look at those shows and say, wouldn't it be great if these could be big spectacles like Busby Berkeley did for the movies in the 1920s? And I told the pop stars that. And in those days, they went, no, man, no, 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 no. And uh, because in those days, there was show business and rock and roll and never the twain should meet. You see some nodding heads. You can tell they're older over here. And um, I became a stage designer. And I design, hung out in a lot of theaters. And I went to a lot of scenery workshops. And I designed stage sets for the big rock shows as they went touring around the world. And I did that up till 1985, which is a year I'll remember because it was the year of Live Aid. And we did that as a business. We did that as a design business. And suddenly, that business really grew up. And um, suddenly, these highfalutin designers from New York, theater designers, came along on the stage. And I was looking around me. And you know, I was an amateur who had started out doing things and having ideas, because I'd left school when I was young, so I never had the imagination and educated out of me. And I started looking around and here were these guys. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I had a sort of moment of crisis in my life, which I've had a, quite a few of along the way. And I remember thinking to myself, I've got to get out of this business. And I'm sure none of you have ever had this thought. I've got to get out of this business before I get found out. And I spent a couple of years in the wilderness, and then I started selling television rights. I knew the managers of the groups of rock shows in the very early days of video and films about rock shows. I started things, films to um, TV stations. So for me, the hard bit about, put up that other slide for me, will you? The hard bit about the world, the life, and everything. You can put that other one back up again now. The hard bit about the world and life and everything has never been the doing of it. The hard bit for me has been the knowing where I'm going. When I know that I'm here, and I know, like I've done with Yo Home over here, when I can see it in here and imagine it in here, and I know that I'm going to get to here, when I know where I'm going, that I want to get to here, I can get up in the morning and I can do all the things I need to do. But when I don't know where I'm going, I get lost. Goethe, Goethe, who was a German philosopher, big old gray beard, you know, 200 years ago. Goethe in an old German age, you know, austere, no smiles. Goethe, nearly 200 years ago, 
Goethe said this, he said, when you know where you're going, he said, when you're truly committed, he said, the world conspires to help and support you in all sorts of ways that you could never have believed possible, including the provision of financial assistance. And I love that last bit, you know. The idea that if you get out of your comfort zone, if you walk right out of your comfort zone and you get right ahead, because everybody comes to me and they say, how do we start a business? And I, I've got everything in place, but I haven't got the money in place. And I never had the money in place for anything I did. I haven't even got it in place for the yo homes I'm going to build. You know, to go right out so that you've got completely committed and you have to do it. What actually happens, and it happened with me with Yo Sushi, is the money's in the corner and they, they think he's actually going to do it. And so they run after you. And I remember at the age I was going to be, a, when I was growing up, I got voices going. I've been speaking on that stand all day. But when I was growing up, I, was, I remember telling you, it's not a very it's a nice story in a way. It doesn't make me out to be very modest. But when I was a little kid growing up, I probably had quite low self-esteem for whatever reason. It has to be something that drives you in this world. And I remember saying to people, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 20. And then I got to 20, and it was the end of the 60s, and we were still having a good time, you know, doing all those things that we did in the 60s. And I remember um, thinking, well, actually, that sounds like a lot of hard work. I'm not going to be, be a millionaire until 20. I think I'll put it off till I'm 30. And then I remember going through my 30s, and for the few of you here in your 30s, and I remember going through my 30s, and, you know, your 30s are the hardest decade of the lot. Your 30s are the decade when you suddenly, you know, you're taking on a mortgage, you're probably getting married, you're into your career, and suddenly there's a drama that goes on in your 30s. I know there was for me, you know, it was a, the sort of, you know, I'm on the phone, I'm too busy to talk to you, and it's a real drama, and you're learning how to get it all together and make it happen. And I remember going through the drama of my 30s and getting to 40, and suddenly having a sort of, well, what was really, it was a sort of tear your hair out moment. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, I have completely forgotten to become a millionaire. And I remember somebody had been talking about the comfort zone, the idea, put that slider back up again if you would, very kindly. Somebody had been talking about facing the comfort zone. Somebody had been talking about the comfort zone. And <coughs> for me, it was a metaphor that really resonated, you know, the idea of a comfort zone. Because it's a funny thing, that idea of a comfort zone, because if it was comfortable inside a comfort zone, you probably wouldn't be talking about it in the first place. But for me, the metaphor was that I was standing on a beach on the sand, and I took a stick and I drew a circle around myself. And when I was inside that circle, I was in a comfort zone. You know, I'd be, I was still earning a living at the, that time. And, uh, but you know, it was only just, I always felt I could do better. And I was standing inside that comfort zone. And I know today that when I step outside of that comfort zone, what do I feel? I feel scared, fear very common human emotion for all of us. And I know when I step back, you know, the, the natural human reaction when you feel fear is to step back, you know, we're taught to sort of step back where it feels comfortable again. But as any actor will tell you, but when you step outside the comfort zone for a reasonable period of time, you start to get used to that feeling of fear. There's a book called, anybody read that book called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway? It's a crap book. I've saved you 9.99. But it's a good title. It tells you all you need to know. And when you step outside, what happens is like the pebble dropped into the lake, the ripples go out, and the comfort zone gets bigger. And I remember that I determined at the age of 40, just over 40, that that was what I was going to do. And I went out to find what the next part of my destiny was going to be. And. Um, I was, my dad always used to say, go and ask people's advice. It's amazing what they'll tell you. If you actually, and the higher up you go, people love to be asked advice. By the way, I don't believe in elevator pitches. If you want to get somebody to do something, don't come up to me and give me an elevator pitch. I do not want to know. 
The best way with me, and I'm not, please don't do it, but just make friends. In fact, I call it the seven meeting rule. Don't try and get somebody to say yes. Try to get them not to say no. Make friends, because if you go to seven meetings with them, it's almost bound to happen. But I was looking around and for things to do. And my dad said, go and ask people's advice. And so I was asking people's advice. And I was lucky enough to be, I was a bit down on my luck. And I was about lucky enough to be taken out to a lunch by a guy called Mr. Uahara, a Japanese guy I knew from the TV business, from Fuji Sankey Television. And Uahara-san, Mr. Uahara, and I was sitting eating sushi in Bartley Square. And I was saying, oh, what do you think I'd be good at? You know, I need to do something. And I'm going to run out. And you know, I don't know what to do next. And da 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 and uh, Mr. Uahara, was, I could see him thinking. And there was a bit of an oriental silence. And Ian Dury, who is one of my, I'm a fan of, Ian Dury always used to say, always wait until the silence ends. And I waited till the silence ended. And Mr. Uahara looked up from this oriental silence and he said this to me. He said, what you should do, Simon, this was in 1995, he said, what you should do, Simon, is a conveyor belt sushi bar with girls in black PVC miniskirts. Well, we never did the miniskirts, but it was in that moment I decided to do Yo Sushi. And I found out there were 2,500 conveyor belt sushi bars. This was before the internet. There were 2,500 conveyor belt sushi bars in Japan, and they've been going since the 1960s. And you can imagine how difficult it was to find out about all that because Japan was a foreign country in those days. You know, there's no internet, you know, it was miles away. The last great, you know, great mystery of the East, you know, how time has progressed. But anyway, I did. And one day I got a brochure through the door, you know, tied up with bits of Japanese string with katakana writing. And I got a brochure through the door and I opened this brochure. And there between the hieroglyphics of Japanese writing, it, um, you know, I discovered the, the, all of this stuff. And then I got one through, another of these brochures through, and it was in English. It was rather bad English, badly translated. But it had a hundred bullet points. And it told you exactly how to start a conveyor belt sushi bar. And I remember holding this thing, I couldn't believe my luck. And I, I remember holding this thing, and the first thing I thought is this is amazing. You know, I'm gonna be very, very rich and very, you know, all that. And then I remember holding it, and, and then I thought to myself, my God, I hope nobody else has seen this. And I set myself, what I did was, I set myself three months. I gave myself three months, interesting period of time, three months, because three months is nearly 100 days. And when the mountain in front of you seems overwhelming, if you just chip off 1% improvement a day, just do a tiny little bit every day, at the end of three months, 100 days, you've got nearly 100% improvement. And at the end of that 100 days, I knew a great deal about Japanese conveyor belt sushi. And I'm sure that none of you have this, but I have this little voice in the back of my head, you know, that manages to commentate on my life. And over the years, to sort of try to stop that happening, I, um, I've, I, I invented this thing that I call acting as ifs. Instead of saying I'm going to be, start the world's largest chain of conveyor belt sushi bars, that's going to be a brand that goes on to do Yotels and Yobelows and yo zones and yo homes now, to which my brain goes, no way, Jose, you can't even get out of the bed some, some mornings. You know, I say all I'm going to be a do is actor, and I'm going to do that. And you know what happened at the end of that three months? I was waking up in the morning, and that negative voice was gone. And do you know what's happening in my head? There's a new voice that's waking up, me up, and this voice is going, you are going to be very, very rich and very, very famous and very, very successful. Unfortunately, I've been around long enough in this old world to know that this voice is just as big a delusion as this one, but this one gets you jumping out of bed in the morning. You know, this one gets you out of the morning. And I walk into the office and there's a group of people and because I believe it, there's a bit of you doubting Thomases that are going to go, maybe he's right. You know, it's a funny thing, confidence, isn't it? Because when you haven't got confidence, it's like the winter. You can't imagine the summer. And when you haven't got the confidence, you haven't got it. So you have to act as if to get to the point you can do that. And I was going to open that restaurant at the end of one year. 
And I was very lucky because I lost my deal. The rug was pulled from underneath me at the very last minute. And people said, this is never going to happen. Because if I'd opened that restaurant at the end of one year, I'd have opened a typical Japanese conveyor belt sushi bar. And in the second year, all the things happened that made Yo Sushi a big success when we eventually opened in Poland Street in, in, in Soho. January the 22nd, big day in my life, 1997. It was in that second year, you know, I figured, look, I've got a conveyor belt going around. At least people are going to walk into my restaurant. They're going to look through the window and say, oh, there's a conveyor belt going around in that restaurant. You know, whatever you do in this world has got to be great, 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 great. There is so much competition out there. But you've got to have something that wave a flag so that people can notice you. I call it being outrageous. And um, you know, passion and vision were the words of the last decade or two. And, I think so being outrageous is in a good way, you know, to be outrageous, to be noticed, so that people like Yo Home here, to be noticed, to do something that is bold and different and goes ahead in the world. And in that second year, you know, I put in um, still and carbonated water that you could help yourself to at every table in the O Sushi. I put in call buttons, and when you press the button, instead of being like a supermarket to get the waiter's attention, instead of going ding dong, it went, yo, I want my sake now. People were coming in, you know, yo, bring me sushi now. People were coming in going, I don't even like sushi. I just want to press those buttons. It's a lot of fun. The food's still got to be great, 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 great to get people in. And then I remember thinking, we're serving drinks in, uh, we're serving everything in different way. We're still serving drinks in a conventional way. I thought what I want is a trolley that drives automatically around the room serving 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 the drinks sushi on the conveyor belt just drives around and then i thought robot is robot a great word and i couldn't get a robot for love or money so i thought i'd go to one of the universities and get university students to build me one for cheap and um, i remember calling them all up and I made you get through to Edinburgh University, actually, and the phone went ring, 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 ring. And this girl at the other end, this was 20 years ago, this girl at the other end said, this is Edinburgh University. It's the robots department here. How can I help you today, sir? <laughs> and I took their technology and married them with a company called Brilliant Stages, who do the big rock and roll touring shows, used to very fast track development of big things turning up on time. And about four weeks before we opened that first restaurant in Poland Street in Soho on a building site, um, brilliant stages turned up with a prototype of this robotic trolley and we watched, we watched it drive very, very slowly and seemingly unaided across the front of the restaurant and turn as if of its own volition and drive up the aisle. And I'll tell you what, fear, my fear level went down. I thought at least people are going to come in and look at this. The food's still got to be great, great, great. And my fear level went down, especially because as it turned the corner, it spoke. Because part of my specification was each one would speak and each one would speak in character. And this is this one turned the corner. It said, move your fat ass. It said, somebody's got, I really did say, somebody, it was after 9 o'clock, it said, somebody's got a fucking job to do in this restaurant. And we opened, and I remember seeing American tourists. I remember seeing this one American tourist, and his wife was standing there. He said, John, John, do you hear what he said to me? And I realized, oh, it's a robot, he said. And I realized that you can be rude to people and get away with it. In fact, you can do anything in this world if you change the fundamentals, which is what I've tried to do if you go and have a look in your home. The home has never been the city center apartment, has never been changed since it was first ever invented. And what I've always tried to do with Yo is to do something radical with what we do for very good reason and for very classic thing, not to do some sort of mad project, but to do something that is different. You need to start off with the premise that there is an empty board. You know, I was never, I mean, ignorance is too strong a word, but I left school with two low levels. You know, I never had that education, so I don't see all those problems ahead. If we have big corporates, you know, they would never do anything like this or that because there would always be a reason not to do it. And that is why we are so lucky, probably most people standing here today, to work in small businesses or in entrepreneurial endeavors because we can do what big businesses can't have because big businesses have too many. What do they have too many of? Meetings. 
How many of you go to meetings and committees? I challenge you this. If you search all the parks in all the world, you will not find a statue to a committee. If we had tried to do Yo Home with a committee, it would never have happened. Somebody would have ever, there is a reason not to do everything. You have to suspend this belief, walk ahead into the dark with your eyes closed. They really were closed. There, I can get to there. And then solve the problems as you go. You can't wait for all the money to be in place, for everything to be in place. You need to be far out, way ahead of your comfort zone. And to be outrageous, and you know, um, we opened that restaurant. We opened that first restaurant. And within a week, we had a queue down the block. Why? Because we had done market research. If I'd, if I'd said to you, here's your, my focus group, would you like to eat raw fish off conveyor belts with robots serving the drinks? You would not have said yes. Uh, the, you're my next focus group for my next project. You know. Well, Yo Below is a different thing. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the hotels, would you like to sleep in an eight square meter room with no natural light? You're not going to say yes, are we? Yo Tells, Gatwick South Terminal, Heathrow Terminal 3, um, Schiphol Airport, 750 bedrooms in New York. The airport hotels we sell by the block of hours. I've stood up at conferences and Kurt Ritter from Radisson Hotels stands up and he says, gentlemen, we did 98% occupancy last year. And I was actually on after him and I said, well, actually, so I've never actually done a hotel before, but our hotel trading at Gatwick and Heathrow does 250% occupancy. Sell it by the block of ours. The most popular check-in time is 10 o'clock at night. The next most popular check-in time is 7 o'clock in the morning and then another one in the afternoon. Um, and those hotels have, uh, they're very, very luxurious. They have everything that a four-star hotel has, but they also, um, the windows don't, look outside, they look onto the corridor so we can go into places that nobody else can go into. Corporate would never do that. You know, you could you'd shut that idea out first, but it just seems so obvious to me. And when people first walked into that hotel, the focus group wouldn't have said yes. What is this guy dreaming about? But when we people walked into that first hotel, they said the magic words. And being to your home, you'll know what they are. The magic words. And the magic words go like this. This is what I'm always looking for in everything I do. The magic words go like this. This is so obvious. Why didn't somebody do this before? We opened Yo Sushi and there was a queue down the block. We had done something different. The food still had to be great, great, great. And I can tell you that it was first week it was empty, the second week we had lines queues down the block like we've had outside Yo Home here. And um, it was a pretty big feeling of relief. And uh, we opened a second one at Selfridges and then one at Harvey Nichols, they were Harvey Nichols first and then Selfridges and then one at Finchley Road. And I'll tell you what, it was like having a hit record. The money was rolling in. And I was running the business. So the money was rolling right back out again. And I learned the greatest lesson of my life. Try to figure out what you're good at and what you love to do. It's very fearful, this world. And we do things because we have to. But try to hang on to that dream you had when you were a 16-year-old, like I was when I was that 16-year-old. Try to hang on to it, because if you can do what you dream of doing, even at the risk of financial insecurity, if you can do what makes you happy, you become good at it. And if you can spend 50, 60, 70, 80, now 90, 95, maybe 99% of your time doing what you love and what you dream about, you're going to be very good. It stands to reason you're going to be very good at doing what you do. And that's what people do who step outside their comfort zone and follow their dream. You know, I never met anybody who went out to do something, um, even at the risk of financial insecurity of themselves. And I never met the person who went out to do something, even when they failed later, even when they failed later. 
I never met the person who did that and regretted it, regardless, probably maybe a few, but pretty much not, regardless of whether they succeeded or failed. But I met many, many people who at an older age said, I wish I'd taken that opportunity when it reared its head. Because as we walk through life, all we really have to do is get out of the front door of our house and get out in front of people and be willing to fail a little bit as well. Because failure is about self-esteem, isn't it? It's a horrible feeling when you get rejected. And I used to, when I was starting Yo Sushi, I had, um, I remember, I had, you know, I, I thought I could design it because I came from a design background, of course, and I could imagine it all in my head. But um, I, 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 I had, didn't have two things. I didn't have the money, and I didn't have any track record in the restaurant business. So I really focused down on those two things. And I used to set myself goals. You know, you're all going to have a few goals, really. I set myself goals. But some, I'd set myself goals to fail. I'd say, today, I'm going to go and see three people about getting the money and three people about getting the real estate. And when I came home at night to my little West London flat, I used to punch the air because I'd got six failures in my bag because I knew that if I was able to do that and keep on doing it, but like Thomas Edison and the light bulb, I would eventually get there. I think that is the one thing that uh, is common to all successful people. You look around you at successful people and you think, you know, like the dragons when I was on Dragon's Day, and you know, you look at those sort of people and you think they go around succeeding all day. Truth is, they don't. Successful people fail. Successful people set out the comfort zone, and successful people are willing to fail and do things. So, um, Yo Sushi went on, and um, I actually handed over the running of it to a guy called Robin Rowland, who runs it to this day. We've built um, over 100 restaurants now we've built in total and starting to go out around the world now. And Robin took us into our first venture capital deal. And I never really believed that that venture capital deal was going to have. I was very, very nervous because I had everything on the block. And by this time, it's worth quite a bit of money. And, but there were some wobbles. We didn't exactly tell the venture capitalists that there were some wobbles. But we eventually got to the day of the deal when it was going to be signed. And I remember going to the office with all these lawyers. We'd been negotiating for six months. I'd been having sleepless nights. Fortunately, Robin absolutely was focused at this time. And he led the cavalry charge to make that thing happen. And so much so had I not uh, realized, you know, as I had not thought it was really going to happen, I thought it was all going to go wrong um, because we were taking our eye off the ball of the restaurants and focusing on the deal. And I thought it was going to go wrong, but I hadn't arranged for anywhere to put the money because I owned 85% of the business and I was going to reduce my business, my shareholding in Yosushi to 25%, so I was going to get most of the money. And um, Robin got some as well. But um, so fearful was I really, but I, I didn't really think it was going to happen and that I hadn't arranged for anywhere to put the money. So I go into the office on the day of the deal, and they give me 39 documents to sign, and I'm signing all the documents, and I'm thinking, this is really going to happen. And suddenly, all these lawyers had been horrible, started being nice. And I sign my deal, and we have a glass of champagne, and they say, where do you want the money? And in those days, we had checkbooks. So I didn't really know where to put the money, so I pulled out my checkbook, gave them the sort code and my current account number. And uh, they said, this money will be in your bank account within 20 minutes. And I had a couple of glasses of champagne, went down the stairs, walked down Oxford Street, which is where I lived in those days, just in Fitzrovia. And as I came down Oxford Street into Wells Street, and I just came around the corner, there was a pin machine that I always used to use. And I figured that if the money was in my account, that must be 20 minutes ago. So if I put my pin number in, um, the money would be in the account. So I stood in the queue, got up to the pin machine, punched in my, sort, my, my PIN number, and there on the screen was a small number This on this first sale of millions of pounds. In my account, I've never had any real money. I was out, and it was in my account. And I'll tell you something, all of you here. If anybody tells you that money doesn't make you happy, they're lying. And I'll tell this story against myself, but I did turn around to the person behind me in the queue. By this time, I'd been looking at it for ages. There was a sort of queue behind me, and there was a bloke, and he kept coughing and spluttering, and I just turned around like this. I said, excuse me, mate. I said, copper, look at this. <laughs> so Robin went off and started doing Yo Sushi, and I started to think weird. By this time, we had Yo to go, the delivery service, we had, um, we had done three Yo Below bars. 
And yo below were these very low Japanesey tables, a bit like the Japanesey table in yo home that comes up out of the floor. Uh, these were Japanesey tables, and we had uh, we had self-serve beer at every table. We pressed the, the button, and it served the third of the pint of beer. People used to come and compete to look for the ratchet up. That would work very well. And we had singing waitresses. The DJ says, you can't do melody. They loved it in the end, the DJs. The waitresses were singing on the table. It was a party going on. Um, and the office back at home were going, are you sure you want to do this, Simon? We are focused on rolling your sushi out, and you're doing these like mad bars. We even had, it was about the time of this, before the smoking ban. There were two things going on. They were talking about banning smoking. And it was just at the time they were talking about legalizing marijuana. I mean, how mad can the world get? Legalize marijuana and ban smoking at the same time. And uh, anyway, I thought a really good solution would be to put smoke extracting ashtrays. And they were so successful, people used to say, is there any smoke over there? Can they come and sit? Because you could watch the smoke going out through the ashtray, you know, being extracted. And the Times came run down around one day, and they said, well, I was showing this bar, and they said, well, you know, God, it's so innovative. He said, I was showing the smoke extracting access. He said, whatever next? I said, well, actually, when they legalize marijuana, we're going to suck all that smoke into a special room and charge people to go in there. And they said, it's called yo to blow. You know, publicity at all costs. Whatever you do is still got to be great, 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 but go out and be noticed for God's sake and be bold. It's not all a logical, linear thing where we are great and we are lucky as entrepreneurs. Is we can go out and do our own thing and we don't have to sit through 20 committee meetings and we can do something that catches the imagination is it's bold. If you do linear things, it is the reason that most accountants are not entrepreneurs. Think about that one. If you're too logical, you can never do anything because there's fear and disaster around every corner. But a good fighter is how wars are won. Wars are not on complete strategy. They're often won at the front. And I started looking around at what I wanted to do, and I started looking at hotels. And I remember we started with a blank sheet of paper, and we eventually came down to the very small, we wanted to do rooms that didn't look, where the windows looked onto the corridor, and because we could go into places that no other hotel could go into, which in the airports, we've been putting hotels where no other hotel here competes with us. So do we get a good rent? Yes, we do, because there's nobody competing for those sites with us. But, you know, and I remember building the polys first polystyrene mock-up in our car park down in Clerkenwell of Yo Sushi. And Gerard Green, who was with me by this time, you know, and I walked into it. We've neither of us slept a week before, and we walked into a hundred square foot room with, a, with no natural light. And even in polystyrene, we had been worrying all night that it wouldn't work. You'd feel claustrophobic. We built this polystyrene. We walked in and went, "This is so sweet." Gerard said, I want one in my garden. These are great. These are fantastic, like little huts. And of course, if you make them really luxurious, if you research it, it would never happen if you make them really luxurious. So then we built another prototype. And seven years ago, we came here. We actually had raised some money. We had raised some money on a business plan, just on a written business plan, on the fact that Yosushi had been successful and I'd been able to do that. People believed me, and we raised the money. And we came here and built a prototype with our own money and put it into 100% design. And 18 months later, we had a deal uh, to build one inside the airport at Gatwick. Had that been a plan? Was that our business plan? Absolutely not. We had always planned to go into city centers. But then Gatwick came along. We opened it. And suddenly, we realized we could sell them by the block of hours. And by that time, there was a few of us involved. So there were meetings, and people were going, you can't solve them in block of hours. What will people say? You know, people will say, you know. And I said, just let's just do it. And I managed to persuade them. And of course, we're still doing it to this day. Do we have a problem with sleaze? No, we do not. And journalists used to come up to me and say, they'd say they were always a bit coy. They'd say, oh, you're going to sell these rooms by the hour. But what about you know what? And I'd go, what do you mean? They said, well, you know, won't it be a sort of, and in the end they'd get it out. They said, won't it be a sort of, you know, won't you get escorts or be a knocking shop? And I, I used to turn to them, I'd say, that is such a good idea. I hadn't ever thought of that. And by the time they'd got over it, they'd forgotten about that and it never got mentioned because it was their idea in the first place, you know.
There's always a way through everything. Anyway, we opened that first hotel, and as I told you, they said the magic words. This is so obvious, why doesn't somebody do this before? And I had um, a guy called Alan Strang came down one day, he's in the rag trade, and he said, you, this is such a great band, we should start um, uh, a clothing range. And he took me down to Pitiomo in Florence, which is where all the rag trade people went. And I remember going around this, this stand, and I thought the fashion business would be this big, sophisticated business. And as I walked around this enormous place like this with all fashion people in it, they were all, they all had shades on and kind of Mohicans and hair and this and that and the other. I said to Alan, I said, they look, all look like drug dealers. And he said, yeah, they all used to be. <laughs> and um, anyway, we started that and three years later we closed that down. And I was very lucky really because I'd watched Virgin and at one time Richard Branson had 200 um, different things under one brand called Virgin. You know, Virgin Cola, Virgin Vodka. I mean, I could have told him that, couldn't you? And he virgin brides, and he closed them all down. Only a few ever made money. And then, of course, Stelios, uh, was easy jet, he tried to do the same thing. And I was just watching and going, actually, I was going to merchandise it. I was going to go into all these things. People were coming up to me with ideas. I had, I've got a pitch on my wall at home where somebody came, said, you should go into the funeral business. It's not a bad idea, actually. You know, I'm sure somebody will and really reinvent it and do it really, really well. But his pitch was that it's a distress sale. You know, it's the repeat business. You'll never, you know, you'll never, you'll never run out of business. You'll never be put out of business by technology and all this stuff. And in the end, I said, "What's it going to be called?" Well, he said, "I know your bars are called that, but why couldn't we call it Yo Below?" So people have pitched me all sorts of things, but I really stuck to it and I thought, no, I don't want to do lots of things. I just want to do one thing at a time. And Yo Sushi, Yo Tell was a success. I'd had my second hit record. You know, it's just like having a hit record. I'd had my second and they say that's the hardest one to have. And then I was, spent a long time working on Yo Zone, which is something I still want to do, which is to bring spas to everybody. Because what the Yo brand does, apart from innovation, is to... Um, it is to, to really innovate and try to give to everybody what rich people have. That's my little thing. And that's what I've done here with Yo Home, which I'm presenting here for the first time. Um, when I was a kid growing up at school, I always figured that if you told other people your ideas, they would copy them. Here, at 60 years old, I realize that it is only by talking what you do, unless something is patentable, and there's very, very few things that are patentable in this world. Uh, but by talking about things, it makes them happen and gives them an impetus and enthusiasm. So that's always what I've done. I'm sure there'll be lots of other people who do similar things to us, but hopefully we'll be the, the yo of it or the Coca-Cola of it. So thank you very much for coming. I'm happy if we've got time, if we, where's the boss? Uh, thank you, thank you. And we can do some questions if you want, if you want.